Hi, this is Philip Cotro with DepthsOfPentecost.com, teachings that bring you deeper into the Word of God. Uh, this is part four of our New Testament series, and we're going to be talking today about why Paul wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians. There were actually four epistles written by Paul to the Corinthian church, and we only have two of them. So when some critics say that the New Testament is incomplete, they are partially right. Uh, there are two letters to the church in Corinth that Paul writ wrote uh, that have not been found, but it's unlikely that they contradict anything in the Bible overall. Last week, uh, we talked about Paul's second missionary journey, where he went to Greece, uh, vis visited uh, Macedonia, which is the northern territory of Greece, and Achaia, which is the southern territory of Greece. The capital of Macedonia was Thessalonica, and uh, that's where Paul wrote uh, the first two epistles to the Thessalonians, which we talked about last week. Uh, uh, Corinth is actually the capital of Achaia, which is the southern part of Greece. Co the Corinth was actually named after a type of grape that grows in the region. Uh, Corinth is a Roman colony. It is a coastal city. It has a huge slave market. Uh, in fact, a third of the population of the city are slaves. Uh, it is a very wealthy trade city. And what that means, this is an important strategy that Paul establishes. When he plants new churches, he'll sometimes go to coastal cities or cities where there's a lot of trade and commerce going on because they have a lot of uh, wealthy merchants coming in and out of the city, uh, traveling from afar. And by establishing a church and, and planting Christians there, there's more people that can share the gospel that will then, you know, get converted to Christianity and then go back to their homelands. And this will help the gospel of Jesus Christ spread naturally and organically on its own. And so Corinth is a perfect location with that. Um, it's a wealthy coastal city. It connects the east and the western empires. It is a cultural melting pot at the time. Uh, Corinth, uh, the people of Corinth speak at least a half dozen different languages. Uh, there's a lot of different ethnicities there. There's Greeks, there's uh, Asians, there's Africans, there's Romans, there's Jews. There's just a lot of different people. And there are gods everywhere. Uh, Corinth is known for its wild party atmosphere. It's almost like a New Orleans of the time. Uh, people get drunk, they party, they go wild in the streets. Uh, there's a lot of worship of uh, idol gods. And the prostitution is probably the biggest market there. Uh, prostitution is so big in Corinth that uh, in the ancient world, sometimes a prostitute is known as a Corinthian girl. That just is a nickname, even if they're not really from Corinth. It's just a nickname throughout the Roman Empire. A loose woman is referred to as a Corinthian girl. Uh, the reason for this is because in Corinth, there's a huge temple to the Greek goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love and fertility. And um, in the city, it's considered part of their culture that if you're a man and you happen to be walking by the temple, if there's a temple prostitute outside of the city and she invites you to come in with her and uh, commit fornication with her, it is expected of you culturally uh, to go in and do it. Now this obviously is a difficult place for there to be a thriving Christian church. And the church that grows here has a lot of pressure on it from the outside world to uh, try to cave in to pressure to commit sin and so on and so forth. But then in a way, this is a, a perfect place. It is such a dark city with sin that it's a perfect place for the light of the gospel to shine through. So uh, any church here would have trouble growing. But at the end of Paul's second journey, uh, he has left Galatia, he's left Greece, and he starts preaching in a synagogue at Ephesus. Remember last week, when Paul was done with his second missionary journey, uh, he stopped by a, a city in Asia Minor called Ephesus, uh, and he didn't really plan a church there, but he started to preach the gospel in the synagogue and won a few converts, and these converts will later help him actually plant the church and let it grow. So he's, he returns back to Antioch of Syria, which at this time is where Christianity is located and is sort of the headquarters of Christianity. Uh, but when Paul starts his third journey, he goes to Ephesus first, and he joins two Christians named Aquila and Priscilla, and they begin the work of planting a church here in Ephesus. And he's going to stay here for a very long time, a few years at least. And uh, somewhere at about this time, there's a new apostle who enters the scene, and he's a bit of a colorful figure. His name is Apollos. Apollos is a well-spoken, very cultured, very intelligent uh, uh, traveler, and he's from Alexandria in Egypt. 
Uh, he's multilingual. He uh, is a very impressive orator. He can get up and really speak clearly in front of people. A uh, very smart, very intelligent man. And at some point, Apollos converts to Christianity. And he becomes educated in Christianity in Ephesus. Uh, later on, Apollos will probably be the author of the book of Hebrews. So in 54 AD, Apollos is eager to share his new faith. He has just the total fire for God. He's very intelligent. He knows the Old Testament very well. He now knows the New Testament very well, or at least the, the New Testament hasn't been fully written yet. But, but you know what I mean about the Gospels, about Jesus Christ, the message of Christ, the New Testament. So he travels to the city of Corinth, which has already been planted by Paul a few years before, and it's already starting to grow. Um, and as he speaks to Corinth, he impresses them with his oratory skills. He gets up and he just preaches to them, and they're just wowed by his amazing uh, mastery of their language, um, and uh, as well as his personal charisma. So Apollos goes there, and shortly after he arrives, the apostle Peter also arrives in uh, Corinth. And Peter impresses them as well because he has these amazing gifts for miracles. You know, P Peter can pray for the sick and they can be healed. And he's so anointed that people, the Bible tells us that, you know, people can be healed merely by touching his shadow. So the Corinthians are really wowed by Apollos. They're really wowed by Peter. And an interesting split starts to develop in the church at Corinth. Where some of the Corinthian Christians actually become more loyal to one apostle or the other. They almost form like teens. There are some Corinthians who are loyal to Paul. There are some Corinthians who are loyal to Apollos. And there are some who are loyal to Peter. And they actually start to form rivalries amongst them. And they get so focused on which apostle they're loyal to, they start to kind of forget about Jesus, uh, who is supposed to be the one that it's all about anyway. So Paul is having great success in Ephesus while all this is going on. He is preaching, and he's winning many converts, and the church in Ephesus is growing by leaps and bounds every day. And at this point in the book of Acts, it tells us Paul is so anointed when he preaches at Ephesus that uh, rags and claws and handkerchiefs that are touching his body can be used to heal the sick, to pray for people. Uh, and they're, they're healed merely by touching those aprons. But then a dark cloud starts to form around the Roman Empire. Right around this time, while Paul is staying in Ephesus, the Emperor Claudius dies. And uh, Claudius was poisoned by his wife, and his wife's son becomes the next emperor, and his name is Nero. Now, at first, Nero won't be too bad of a ruler, ruler but about five years as Caesar of Rome, he will become one of the most horrible, brutal, sadistic rulers Rome ever had. Uh, now, let me, before we get into the lesson a little further, let me give you yet some more background info. About 10 years before this happened, so we'll say about 44 AD, uh, there was a terrible famine that struck the Roman Empire. Uh, now, this was happening at about the time that Christianity was starting to move out of Jerusalem and move to Antioch of Syria, the next city, which would ultimately become the central headquarters of Christianity. And while this was happening, there was a prophet in Antioch who uh, was revealed by the Spirit of the Lord that this great famine was actually coming. And so uh, the church in Antioch prepared for it. And they were uh, well equipped when that famine came. And the famine hit the Roman Empire hard. But the Christians in Antioch pretty much uh, had saved up all their food and they were well to do off while people were starving in the rest of the world. Uh, it hit Jerusalem the hardest. The church in Jerusalem was just absolutely devastated by this and people were starving really badly. So bad, in fact, that now 10 years later, uh, in our story tonight, 54 AD, they're still struggling. The people in Jerusalem are still having a hard time finding food and there's still really bad hunger. And Paul has a great um, burden for these people. And he decides that he wants to start a relief fund. So he wants to go around to the different churches that have a, a lot of wealthy members and a, a lot more money. And he wants to start collecting a relief fund to send back to Jerusalem to help them get out of this famine and to get out of this hunger and starvation that they are in. Now let's get back to the story. Apollos has been in Corinth. Uh, Peter's been preaching in Corinth. The split, the three-way split between Apollos, Peter, and Paul is starting to form in the church at Corinth. And Apollos arrives in Ephesus, and he finds Paul, and he tells Paul about what's going on. He says, uh, there's a problem here, Paul. The people of Corinth aren't really loyal to Jesus anymore. They're starting to form loyalties among which apostle is actually their favorite. The other problem is, 
is that uh, the citizens of the city of Corinth are kind of shocked at this new group of people called Christians. Because these Christians are talking about holiness and not partying and not getting drunk and about serving Jesus and being holy and righteous. And they refuse to go into the temple uh, with the prostitutes to commit fornication. And that's considered culturally wrong. It's frowned upon. And there's a lot of pressure put on the church at Corinth to go back into sin. And some Corinthians start to cave. Some of them start going into the temple to commit fornication. And some of them began just giving up and going back into the world and worshiping their idol gods again like they used to, just to, just to get the, the other people of Corinth off their backs. Uh, so there's a lot of terrible things happening. It's a new crisis beginning to form at the church at Corinth. So, 54 AD, Paul writes his first letter to the Corinthians. However, this is not 1 Corinthians. This is actually a lost epistle. We've never found it. Uh, but we do have an idea of what it said because of how it's referenced historically as well as in the other uh, uh, letters to the Corinthians. So basically in this first letter, Paul's ex Paul explains to the Corinthian church that they should follow Christ, not different apostles. He instructs them to avoid fornication at the temple of uh, Aphrodite. And he tells them about the Jerusalem Relief Fund. It's basically, it, it serves three, three purposes. It probably was a very short letter. He gives it to Titus. Titus delivers the letter to the church at Corinth. The following year, spring AD 55, Paul is still stationed at Ephesus. He's still preaching the gospel there, seeing great success. And then a group of Corinthians have left the church and come. They find Paul at Ephesus, and they give him some bad news. They tell him that the issues that he heard about has gotten even worse since he sent his letter. His letter didn't really solve anything. Actually, it made things more confusing. People really aren't sure what to make of the letter that he sent. So they hand Paul a letter from the church at Corinth, and it has a list of questions and a list of complaints. Uh, first of all, there's the fornication issue. People are confused about why they have to abstain from fornication, if you can believe that. Um, there's the issue that comes up about marriage, uh, wearing the marriage veil. In the Roman Empire... Uh, the sign that a woman was married was if she would wear a veil over her head. And that meant that she was taken and she couldn't be approached by a single man who might be interested. Well, the women in this church are starting to take their veils off because they're getting the idea that, well, now that I'm free in Christ, I'm free to not wear my wedding veil. Now, this would be equivalent in today's time of women taking off their wedding rings and acting like they're single again. So that's becoming an issue. Uh, some people within the church have uh, taken Paul's message of abstaining from fornication a little too far, and they think that Paul is demanding absolute, Paul is demanding absolute um, abstinence, even when it comes to sex within marriage. Uh, so there have some married couples that are no longer engaging in intimate relations. There's an issue of some people in the church have uh, spouses who aren't saved. Uh, a big controversy within the church. And again, you have to sort of understand what's going on at the church at Corinth at the time. But basically, uh, your neighbor might worship an idol god, and he might sacrifice meat to that god and then eat the meat and might give you some. Well, some Christians think that this is sinful, that you should not partake of meat that has been sacrificed to an idol god. Uh, there's also the issue of tongues. Some people in the church at Corinth are, have the gift of tongues and interpretation, and some people don't. And during the messages and during the, uh, the gatherings where they will worship together, uh, there will be some people who will get up and shout a message in tongues. But then there will be another person, like a rival of theirs, who gets kind of jealous, and they'll stand up and shout a message in tongues. And then maybe there's a third person, and people are starting to get loyal over who they follow, which person who shouts messages in tongues. You know, it's almost like a, a competition. It really isn't about the edification of the Spirit. It's more about flesh rising up and people wanting to get all the glory. Look at how holy I am. I can speak in tongues and people will prophesy. And, um, you know, it's just leading to a lot of chaos and confusion. But tongues is supposed to edify the church and bring the church together in unity. It's not supposed to divide the church like that. And then there's the issue of the resurrection. Um, there's a new doctrine that's beginning to form within the church of Corinth that there's never going to be a resurrection. There's never going to be a second coming of the Lord. And there's still some confusion over the Jerusalem Relief Fund, exactly what Paul intends to do with this money that he's asking to collect. So, this long, long list of issues and problems that the church in Corinth is having. 
is presented to Paul. Paul writes a very, very lengthy follow-up letter um, answering all of these questions and these issues. This is our 1 Corinthians, his second letter to the church at Corinth. And basically it's Paul trying to answer all of these questions and, and address all of these issues that are going on. So the letter is sent. Uh, that same year, Nero does something that at first seems like a good thing. He, I, I talked about in previous classes, the Emperor Claudius in 16 AD had issued a ban on all Jews from the Roman Empire. And Christians, since Christianity is still kind of a part of Judaism at this time, uh, it is also banned as well. So um, in Rome, Jews and Christians are not allowed. They're just not allowed in the city. Well, now that that ban is lifted, Jews and Christians can start traveling back to the city of Rome and uh, form communities there. Now, at first, this sounds like a good thing, but, uh, you know, Nero will be famous for his persecution against Jews and Christians later on. Uh, but Jews all over the Roman world, they start returning to Rome, they start forming communities, and then Paul sees an opportunity here. Uh, so he sends a group of nine people total, uh, very trusted, very strong in the Lord, spirit-filled Christians, uh, to plant the church in Rome. Uh, but he doesn't go there himself, he just sends them to do it. Uh, and this, obviously, Rome will be a very important church later on in New Testament history. But now, while this has happened, Timothy actually arrives, and he finds Paul in Ephesus, and he gives him more bad news. He tells them that there is a letter, the letter that he had sent to Corinth has been rejected. The Corinthians received it with anger, with hate. They rejected it. They didn't want any part of it. They didn't like the answers that Paul gave. Uh, Paul actually told them they need to abstain from fornication, that they need to live holy, that they can't party or get drunk or do any of these things, and they hate it. They don't want to hear that. Um, there is a member of the church who has stirred up a rebellion against Paul's teachings, and like a lot of the enemies or the bad men of the New Testament, uh, this person is never named. But he basically stirs up a rebellion and says, you know, we need to just stop listening to the teachings of Paul. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's a heretic. And so now there's more division within the church at Corinth over this. So basically, uh, Corinth is in a state of worse crisis than it was before. So Paul decides to go back to Corinth altogether. He leaves his work in Ephesus. He sets sail for Corinth. He finds the church. Uh, he goes and he visits with them. And the result is a disaster. His visit is just a travesty. He gets up and he tries to speak to them. They boo at him. They hiss at him. They tell him to get off the stage. They tell him they don't want his teachings. This, this uh, unnamed rebel against his teachings stands up and shakes his fist and leads others to chant and hiss, get out of here, Paul. We don't want you. We don't want your teachings. And Paul basically leaves the church. He leaves in disgrace. He leaves humiliated and uh, having not accomplished anything. He goes back to Ephesus, and here he writes his third letter to Corinth. And like the first letter, this letter has been lost to us. It's Paul's angry letter. He pens a letter, and it's just filled with rage. He chastises the Corinthians for their, how they treated him. Uh, these were people that used to love him. He demands that they prove their love for him. He demands that they punish the man who stirred up rebellions against his teachings. But as soon as he sends the letter, he immediately regrets it. Paul later returns to Ephesus, but when he gets there, there's a problem. While Paul has been gone, leaving Ephesus and setting sail for uh, Corinth, now he's had great success in Ephesus. He's built a huge Christian church. He's converted a lot of people to Christianity. So many people, in fact, that uh, people all over Ephesus are leaving idolatry. They're starting to destroy their idols. They're starting to turn away, and they're starting to burn their books of spells and witchcraft. And uh, they just don't want any part of it anymore. Now, idol making had been a big business in Ephesus. And people who formed and fashioned idols out of clay and out of, you know, made statues of them now have no business. And they're angry about that. And so these idol makers uh, have been put out of business and they stir up an angry mob against Paul. And they want him cast out of the city. So when Paul arrives in Ephesus, there's an angry mob of 25,000 waiting there for him to cast him out of the city. And so Paul leaves Ephesus in defeat. He barely escapes with his life. And from there, he sets sail to the city of Troas. And Paul is just so discouraged at this point in his ministry, he's, he's practically done. He wants to just forget about the Corinthians, and he wants to forget about the Ephesians. He just wants to move on to other cities that will more fully accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
But uh, he just can't really do that. He tries to move on. He tries to shake that discouragement. But he just can't really get Corinth off of his mind. He has such a love in his heart for the Corinthians, no matter how badly they've treated him. And uh, while he's in Macedonia, he sails back to Macedonia after this, uh, Titus actually finds him. Titus basically brings him good news about the church in Corinth. They're, his harsh letter that he had sent them had worked. The Corinthians have repented. They actually are giving Paul a message that they're sorry for what they've done. And uh, they've taken action against the man that was rebelling against Paul's teachings. And things have gotten much better. The church is starting to get things figured out. It's starting to get things calmed down. But one problem gets solved, another problem takes its place. Now, I've talked about the Judaizers before in the past. The Judaizers are a group of radical Jewish Christian converts who believe that you can't become a Christian unless you convert fully to Judaism first. And only uh, you can only be a Christian if you go through the rituals of circumcision and obey the Jewish law and go by the kosher diet. You have to be fully and completely a devout Jew before you can be a Christian, especially if you're a Gentile convert. Now, these people are troublemakers. They go around and they follow Paul. Whenever he teaches at a church, they go back behind him and undermine his ministry. And uh, they'll tell people that he just preached to that he was wrong and that he's a liar and that he's refusing to teach the full gospel of Jesus Christ because he refuses to tell people about the law. The Judaizers had been defeated. The, the 12 apostles and Paul and the Judaizers all gathered together in the Jerusalem Council in 49 AD. We talked about that in the previous video, why James was written. They were voted out. Um, they were voted down. Paul and Peter all decided to vote unanimously that the Judaizers are wrong, that Gentiles do not need to fully convert to Judaism to become Christians or to go to heaven. But that doesn't stop the Judaizers from causing more trouble. So, as soon as the Corinthian church was starting to get things around and uh, uh, get their lives right, and to stop sinning, and to respect Paul's teachings again, the Judaizers show up, and they stir up more trouble against Paul's teachings, and they have a list of complaints against Paul. First of all, they tell them that Paul cannot be trusted. They tell them that Paul left out the greatest part of the gospel, which is obedience to the Old Testament law. They uh, tell the Corinthians that Paul doesn't have signs and wonders that follow him in his ministry. And they also tell him, uh, tell the Corinthians that Paul's plan for a Jerusalem re relief fund is a scam. And Paul just wants to collect that money and keep it for himself. So, just as things were starting to get better, now there's another crisis uh, at the church in Corinth. So in 57 AD, Paul pens his fourth letter to the church at Corinth. And this is our 2 Corinthians. Uh, the first mission of 2 Corinthians is for Paul to apologize for the harsh letter that he had sent them last. Secondly, Paul responds to the accusations that the Judaizers have brought against him. Uh, one of those is uh, they, they claim that Paul doesn't have signs and wonders that follows him in his ministry. And this is ridiculous. As, you, uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, when Paul would preach, uh, he was so anointed that people could be healed by touching the aprons and the handkerchiefs that were on him. Uh, he tells about the vision of the third heaven that he had many years before. And thirdly, Paul encourages the Corinthian Christians not to listen to the Judaizers and uh, encourages them to give to the Jerusalem Relief Fund. After sending this letter, Paul goes directly to Corinth and says, I'm not going to, th this church is having so much trouble and there's so much strife and division, I'm going to go there personally and stay with them and help them get it all straightened out. So Paul will spend the next few months actually staying at Corinth and uh, personally overseeing to it that they get everything straightened out about uh, truthful doctrine, about uh, whose teachings they respect over whose. And so to say that Paul's relationship with the ch church at Corinth is complicated is clearly an understatement. It's the church that gave him the most trouble. It is the church that he had to send the most letters to, four total. The interesting thing about First and Second Corinthians is that as Christians today, when we read the New Testament, we tend to go back and we really know 1 Corinthians well. 1 Corinthians contains some of the most famous scriptures in the Bible, uh, especially 1 Corinthians 13, which is what we call the love chapter. And we tend today to be able to really quote uh, 1 Corinthians, but 2 Corinthians is kind of an afterthought. If you ask people what is uh, something famous in 2 Corinthians, people will really kind of give you a blank stare. And that's how we look at 1 and 2 Corinthians today today. 
in the Old Testament, in the New Testament times, though, when they, these were written, the first letter, 1 Corinthians, actually did not have that much effect on the Corinthian church. They rejected it pretty much as soon as they wrote it, and that uh, letter became an afterthought. And 2 Corinthians actually had more effect. It accomplished more of its mission of setting the church at Corinth straight. So while Paul is staying at the church at Corinth, he gets good news about the church in Rome. Uh, such good news that he will end up needing to write them a letter as well. And that is what we are going to talk about next week. We will be discussing why Paul wrote Romans. He wrote Romans while he was staying at Corinth, helping them get their issues straightened out as well. So if you like this video, um, I have new ones uh, every week. You can uh, please hit the like button. You can subscribe. You can also subscribe to my weekly blog. Uh, every Saturday I post Bible lessons, depthsofpentecost.com. I'll put links in the descriptions below. Uh, thank you for watching, and God bless. See you all next week.